the glory of Christ and trust in your goodness and power and wisdom for us, then we will not be changed. And so we ask now that you would change us, that we would abide in you, Lord Jesus, and that your words would remain in us and so that we might bear great fruit and transformation and growth for your glory. For apart from you, we can do nothing. So help me to preach and help us all to hear and give us the eyes of faith we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Last Monday, I was feeling overwhelmed and I wasn't sure what to do in the evening. I had too much on my plate. I was feeling overwhelmed by the responsibilities of the week. We had a wedding yesterday. That was probably part of it and a lot of events going on in October. And Frances was on the phone with me trying to figure out, looking for direction for me as her husband and as the father of the kids, looking for direction on what to do with the children this past Monday night. And I shut down. I, I couldn't think anymore. I was burned out. I, I didn't have an opinion. I just wanted to check out. So I eventually thought about it and um, thought about what, what's, what's going on with, with what I was thinking. And it was all of the different responsibilities that I was feeling, at least on Monday, that came to a head. And so I just took a time out, prayed on the couch right here in my study, read my Bible. And then I started to seek. I had one idea of what I could do differently to face this month coming up. And then I sought advice from other people. And I got some pretty good advice. I think I know what I'm gonna do, and I'll maybe share a little bit about just kind of how this applied in my life later on. But the point is that I needed advice, I needed counsel, I needed wisdom. Everyone needs advice at certain points in their lives. Counselors, advisors, consultants, friends, pastors, church members, for some, maybe even strangers, neighbors, we go to a lot of different people and a lot of different places to get advice and counsel and wisdom for what we think we need when we face various situations. The reason we want advice is because we feel burdened. We feel heavy hearted. The path forward isn't clear. And we feel like there's an opportunity for us to make a choice that seems somewhat important to us. So we talk to somebody and we tell them our situation and then we say, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? We all get that, right? We're all there at different times. Confused, stuck, maybe even misdirected, feeling like we're going the wrong way. And then there's a fear inside, the burden that's on the inside where we start to think, well, what if this trial doesn't grow me in maturity? What if my faith in Jesus shrinks? Or what if, it, what if I prove that my faith is not real? Or what if these trials continue and multiply and overwhelm me into despair? Is there ever light at the end of this tunnel of a trial in my life? And so we need wisdom in an ocean of trials with the cacophony of voices and opinions. We need God's wisdom. And the good news is, the good news from this passage, is that God gives wisdom. He gives wisdom. He gives faith. He gives endurance. He gives growth. Maturity. And in the end, God gives us peace. In the middle of our life experience and in the end, he will give us peace. That's good news. That God gives us peace. And so the goal of this passage... If you're reading verses 5 through 8, I think what James wants us to do is, and here's how I stated the main goal, wholeheartedly ask God for wisdom. Wholeheartedly ask God for wisdom. So that you receive wisdom, the wisdom you need to mature in trials. But really, it's the, the first part. Wholeheartedly ask God for wisdom. That's what this passage is telling you to do. You need to look to God and with all of your heart, ask Him to give you his wisdom. And when he gives you that wisdom, uh, that gives you what you need to mature through trials. So to unpack this text's goal of wholeheartedly asking God for wisdom, let's answer three questions. What do we need? 
what must we do and how must we do it, okay? What do we need, what must we do, and how shall we do it? I think those, answering those three questions from this passage will really help us wholeheartedly ask God for wisdom if God would be gracious to us this morning. So the first question, what do we need? That's in chapter 1, verse 5. Now, if any of you lacks what? Wisdom. wisdom, he should ask God. So what do we need? We need wisdom, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, and we do lack wisdom from time to time, so that, that's what we need. We need wisdom. When you're in the moment of trial or in the moment of failing, we need God's wisdom. I follow, I don't know what you follow on social media, among other things, but there's um, different like um, motivational speakers that I follow. Maybe not motivational speakers, mo motivational accounts that give kind of speeches or just different things to kind of get you through the day. And so I was looking at one where it says, where the question was asked, when, uh, asking a motivational speaker, when you're in that moment of failing, but you have to keep going, you can't put it down because other people are depending on you. So when you're in that moment of failing and you have to keep going, what do you say to yourself? And the motivational speaker said, what if? What if I could keep going? What if I could be the 36th of his ethnic people group in the Navy SEALs in the last 75 years? Because they said there's only going to be 35. What if I could be number 36? What if I could pull off this miracle that no one thinks can happen? The what if is what I think about. Yeah, that's okay advice, I guess. It could maybe give you, I, I think the helpfulness of that vice is it, it does lead you to at least start thinking of what you, do, what you believe in. But God gives us more than that. God doesn't give us what ifs. He doesn't just give us positive sentiments that might happen. God gives us wisdom because we need his wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of God's truth. That's a very simple definition. The application of God's truth. Or maybe the application of God's truth to your situation. Wisdom is the ability to apply truth to your particular, specific, and concrete situation. Another way to say it with Jesus in the middle, wisdom here, wisdom in this text is the perspective needed to effectively and joyfully mature in Christ through your trials. Because the, the previous verses, two through four, consider a great joy when you're in trials so that you might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Wisdom is what we lack. When we get that wisdom, it gives us what we need to effectively and joyfully mature through our trials. And James' theme, I said the theme of this book is wisdom. Let's get a picture of wisdom, uh, from a description of wisdom from James 3, 13 through 18. This is what Dr. Varna calls the thematic peak of the book, of the letter. So look at James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Here's a breakdown, a description of wisdom that James is trying to get us to embrace and live in light of. Verse 13 says this, Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. Now there's two types of wisdoms that he's going to contrast. Verses, verses 14 through 16 is the first wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. That wisdom, such wisdom, does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and what? Demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. So there's a demonic, unspiritual, and earthly wisdom leading to bitterness, shows itself in bitterness, selfish ambition, disorder, evil practice. But look at verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first what? Pure. And I think it's important that it says first pure, but we're not going to preach on this passage this morning. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving. Gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without pretense or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. So there's the earthly, unspiritual, and demonic wisdom. Then you have the heavenly, spiritual, and godly wisdom. And what we need in our trials is obviously not the unspiritual, earthly, and demonic wisdom. We need spiritual, heavenly, and godly 
wisdom. Why do we need wisdom? According to this passage, in verse 4 says, if any of, um, so that we might be mature and complete, lacking nothing. The first reason why we need wisdom in verse 5 is if any of you lacks wisdom, because we lack wisdom. That's why we need wisdom. We need wisdom because we lack wisdom. We are not complete or completely mature, and we need God to supplement our wisdom with more wisdom. We need God to refine and strengthen our wisdom. Even when you know what to do in your trial, you still need God's wisdom even in that moment to, to push through in that current trial. So I'm a dad of five kids, and there are certain trials. You know, you have, when, when you, have your first, you have your first kid, you have all kinds of questions. Am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? And then you have a second kid and a third kid. By the time you get to your fifth kid and they're children, you generally know what you're doing. And yet still, you need to apply that wisdom freshly for every child in every situation. You can't just say, well, I, I already knew it from the past, so I don't need to apply the wisdom. No, you need to apply it again. And when you apply it again, by God's grace, you grow in wisdom still more. Because we lack wisdom. We need more wisdom. We can never coast on cruise control as if we, we've already made it there. We need wisdom because verse 2 gave us an impossible command last Sunday. Remember that? My brothers and sisters, whenever you encounter various trials, consider it a great what? Joy. joy. How do you consider it joy? You need God's perspective to consider it joy, right? Trials by definition are trying. And because they're trying, it saps our joy. It takes away our happiness. Unless we have God's perspective to see that trial with his heavenly spiritual and divine wisdom. So we need wisdom for that. You know, even, even Jesus needed wisdom. When you're in trial, remember last week I opened by saying, if you could just snap your finger and you could change one thing in your life, what would you change? It's some trial in your life that you would just change by snapping your finger, right? But our greatest need is not for the trial to go away. Even for Jesus, the greatest need was not for his trial to go away. Do you remember when he was praying in the Garden of Eden and he asked God three times, what was his prayer request? Let this cup, what? Pass from me. Let this cup of the cross, this dying, let it be taken away from me. That's what I need, God. Please take that away, Father, Father in heaven. And does God say yes or no? Does the Father say yes or no? He says no. But still then, Jesus now, after praying three times and crying to the Lord and sweating, even like drops of blood, it says in Luke, even after all that, he was able to stand up from his prayer with the wisdom and the clarity and resolve he needed to move straight forward to that cross without flinching. Because even more than the cup passing from him, what the Lord Jesus needed was communion and clarity from the Father and the resolve and conviction to go forward through the cross and drink that cup. See, what you need is not for your trial to go away. What you need is God's wisdom and clarity and conviction for you to move forward with what he's calling you to do in that trial. That's what we need. So the desire for wisdom is, is, is a good desire. We all need it. Parents, in one sense, you, you could summarize, if someone asks you, parents, uh, how can you pray for, how can they pray for you in your parenting? You could summarize it with saying, pray that God gives my children wisdom. I mean, that's essentially what parenting is, right? We want to raise our kids so that when they are on their own and there's no mom or dad to tell them what to do, that they know God's wisdom and they know what to do and they want to do it because they see the clarity of it and they see the wisdom of it, not because they're forced from ex some external pressure that's telling them that if you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble. That's what we want for our kids, right? We want them to be wise, mature, thoughtful adults. And that's what James is saying that we all need, this wisdom. You know, just a side note, as you study your Bible, when you think of Paul, James, John, and Peter, four New Testament authors who've written a lot, I mean, who've written things in the New Testament, they kind of have their theme. For Paul, his emphasis, generally speaking, is faith, that you would believe. When you think about John, his general emphasis on how you should live is what? Do you know the key word there? Love. John focuses and emphasizes love. For Peter, while we're in trial, Peter emphasizes hope, faith, hope, and love. For James, his emphasis is wisdom. His emphasis is wisdom. 
Now, what is wisdom? I mean, as we keep thinking about wisdom, I want to keep going a little bit deeper here in wisdom. Divine wisdom is not dictation where you follow a tightly um, specific script. You know, when God tells us what he wants us to do, um, God doesn't just, you know, text you a text message on your phone and tell you exactly what to do. What does God give you? The Bible, right? I mean, now this is a bigger Bible than your Bible, probably. It's a wide margin, large print, single column, so it's really heavy. But even then, relatively speaking, this book isn't that big, right? I mean, for all the, all the situations you're going to go through in your life, all the details you need to know for what you're going to do, this book is not that big. It's kind of small to guide a whole church, to guide a whole mission, to guide churches, to reach all ethnic people groups of the world. This is a small book. There's not that many words here. My point here is that when God gives you wisdom, he doesn't give you a script. He doesn't add to the Bible specific Bible verses for your specific trial that you're in this week. He doesn't give you that script. He gives you an invitation into an adventure with him, your creator and your redeemer. As you keep your heart and eye fixed on him, he invites you to follow him into and through your trials. So let's go deeper here a little bit on what wisdom is. What is wisdom? Wisdom is not good grades. Okay, kids? You should get good grades in school. Work hard. It's not about the grades, though. <laughs> it's about learning the material. Okay, kids? Just remember that. In, in the end, it's not about the grades. It's about the learning what you're supposed to be learning. But even then, wisdom is not learning uh, and getting good grades in school. Wisdom is not intelligence. Wisdom is not knowing a lot of things. Wisdom is not merely experience. There are old fools, aren't there? There's a lot of old wise people, praise God for that, in this church, right? Praise God, we have a lot of older, wiser people. But being older doesn't necessarily make you wiser, right? There are old fools who have a lot of experience. So it's not experience. Wisdom is not, even if I could go one step further, wisdom is not understanding theological concepts. You can know a lot of the Bible. You can memorize the Bible. You can know good theology and still and like know the concepts of theology and not be wise. Jesus grew, let me just give you some Bible verses here about wisdom. Jesus grew wise. L listen to Luke 2, 40 and 52. The boy grew up, this is Jesus' childhood. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. Jesus increased... In wisdom. Where does wisdom begin? What is the beginning of wisdom? Those of you who know the Bible, what is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Song, or Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. And then Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 2, 6. What is the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom? And we're going to pick up on this later, though I won't go back to this concept from Proverbs, but I'll just tell you now. The fear of the Lord is a supreme reverence for who God is that frees us, that frees our will to do what God says. Okay? The fear of the Lord is a supreme reverence, a supreme, a supreme valuing or treasuring of who God is that frees your will to do all God says. Wisdom comes not merely from reading or knowing the word, but from other aspects. Listen to Psalm 119. Now, Psalm 119 is all about the Bible. Listen to, this is my favorite section of Psalm 119. And it, listen to how it talks about the Bible and knowing God's word, but it doesn't talk about wisdom or the, the wise life as merely knowing truth, intellectually. Listen to all the different verbs here. How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders. Why? Because I obey your precepts. Not know your precepts, because I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. Do you notice what the psalmist does with truth? He loves it. He meditates on it. It's accompanying him. 
He thinks about it. He obeys it. He follows it. He sees that God is the one giving it to him in a personal relationship with him. It's sweet to his taste. It causes him to hate other things. Wisdom is rightly applying truth, not just knowing it. But where is God's wisdom finally and fully found? Where is it finally and fully displayed? Do the scriptures point to it? They do. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 25. For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. For the Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. Did you hear that? Christ is God's power and Christ is God's wisdom. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. The cross of Christ displays the wisdom of God. Wisdom is ultimately found in Jesus who he is and what he's done. And this cross work is done for us. That's why uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus who became God-given wisdom for us. Jesus becomes God-given wisdom for you and for me. So we need to pursue this wisdom with all our might. But this wisdom is ultimately found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, we went through the overviews of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. One of my favorite verses is in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. I just want to answer this question that, that pops up in my mind when I think about pursuing God's wisdom. Jeremiah 9, 23 says this. This is what the Lord says. The wise person should not boast in his wisdom. The strong person should not boast in his strength. The wealthy should not boast in his wealth. But the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord showing faithful love, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things. So here he's saying, don't boast in wisdom. Boast that you know God. Well, PJ, you're saying we should pursue wisdom. Does that mean we should pursue wisdom over God? What am I saying at the end of the day? Ultimate wisdom is finally expressed in whom? Christ. Jesus Christ. So knowing Christ is wisdom. Knowing Christ is wisdom. So let me summarize again before we get to our second point. We're done with point one, but here it is uh, to summarize it. Wisdom is, what is wisdom? We need wisdom. What is it? Wisdom is understanding how to know, obey, and enjoy Jesus above all things in your specific and actual situation. So it's not theoretical. It's not conceptual. It's not intellectual at the end of the day. Wisdom is understanding in your specific situation right now, in your trial. Wisdom is understanding how to know, enjoy and obey Jesus above all things in that trial. That's wisdom. And if you're like, oh, I know what to do, but I don't want to do it. That's not wisdom. That's called what? Foolishness. It's even more foolish because you know what to do and you don't do it. You're deceiving yourself. Wisdom is not knowing truth only. It's doing it. So wholeheartedly ask God for wisdom. What do we need? We need wisdom. What do we do to get it? Now let's go to the verse now. Back to thinking about wisdom, let's, let's look at the instruction and the exhortation of this passage. James 1.5 says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should what? Ask God. Ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him. So what should you do? When you're, when you're, a friend, when you, when you're stuck in trial, you said already, what should you do? Ask God. Ask God. That's what we do. Who do you turn to when you're in trial? Who do you run to when you're in trial? Who do you call? Who do you text? What is your routine? Did you know you have a routine? Yes. Everyone has habits. You have a routine. You have habits that you do when you're in certain trials. What are your habits? Who do you typically turn to? Here, he's saying, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. So the, the, the command here is to ask. The exhortation here is to ask. Make a request. Prayer at its heart is asking God for things and not being too shy to ask him. Prayer at its heart is asking God for things and not being shy to ask him, but trusting that God wants to hear from you. Brothers and sisters who have good theology, listen to me. You know that God already knows all things, right? And God has predestined all things that come to pass, not just in the past, not just in the present, but where? In the what? 
in the future. Does God have everything that determined for your future? Yes. But don't use that as an excuse to not pray. Don't use an excuse, God already knows the future, it doesn't matter. That's actually bad theology. That's untrue. God knows the future and he uses your prayer to bring about that future. So pray. If you don't pray, the future that is going to unfold is a future that has no answer to prayer because you didn't pray. Your prayer counts in the sovereignty of God. I say that as a seven-point Calvinist, that your prayer counts. It actually does work with the plan of God. So pray. And if you say, well, God already knows. I don't need to ask him. Asking is already a step in exercising some wisdom. For you to ask is growing in wisdom because you're taking a step in obedience by asking for wisdom and you're opening up a channel for God to give you more. Prayer changes your heart, doesn't it? Every time you pray, you have to stop doing other things and focus. For the first, I'll confess here, for the first three minutes of prayer when Peter was praying, our 10-minute prayer, he timed out about 10 or 11 minutes for the prayer petition. Good job, brother. It was a good prayer, very encouraged. But for the first two or three minutes, I was like looking at the time and thinking, oh, I'm stressed about time. And then Peter started praying for, um, for the government and for government leaders. And I just thought, God, you're hearing us right now. You're hearing us right now. And you are responding to this, and you're not only going to answer this in some way for whom we're praying for, you're changing us who are praying right now. And here I am distracted when I should be focused during prayer. And I could almost feel God changing my heart. And for the last seven minutes of the prayer, I was really able to lock in and just commune with God and thank God for every single prayer request that Peter was praying because we're, we're not only praying for these things, but God is changing me and changing us as we pray. So if you lack wisdom, pray. Because even in the prayer, God is changing you. He's getting you ready for more wisdom. But when you ask God, it says, it describes who God is in verse 5, right? And I love this description. This is probably the best, the best part of the whole four verses. Ask God who gives to all what? Generously and ungrudgingly. God gives it to all generously and ungrudgingly. So not only should you ask, you should remember who God is. Who is God? It says here that God gives to all. All. And in the Greek, the word all means all. That's what it means, right? Praise God. This means that God gives wisdom to the discouraged. God gives wisdom to the sinful. God gives wisdom to the hypocritical. God gives wisdom to those who are struggling. God gives wisdom to those who are overwhelmed. God gives wisdom to those who are, shut, who are stuck or shut down. God gives wisdom to the broken. God gives wisdom to the desperate. God gives wisdom to you and to me. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer this in a little bit, but God even gives wisdom to the unconverted, to those who are not in Christ. And I'll pick up on that in a second. But let's go back to this verse because it's so good. God, ask God who gives to all how? How does God give? He gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. Now generously, I love that. God is generous. God is generous. God loves to say yes. He loves to give. He finds joy in giving. Another way you could translate generously is God gives wholeheartedly. God gives with all of his heart, with all his soul. Isn't that wonderful? That God is not half giving. He's not half hearted when he gives to you. He's not 75% willing and his greater willingness is, his willingness is greater than his unwillingness. And so he grudgingly just gives it to you because it's just more convenient to, to him and he's kind of sick of you. That's not, the, that's not what this text is saying. When God gives wisdom to you in your trial, God gives to you with a whole heart with a generous heart, or another way you could translate it is with single undivided intent. He's single-hearted here, single-minded. God is not grudging or half-hearted in his giving. He wants to give, and all of what he wants to do is give. And so he's generous. And then we have the word here, ungrudgingly. God is not grumpy. God is not bringing your sin in your face as you ask. Oh, PJ, you need wisdom again? How many times have you been through this, this sin situation where you're proud against your wife? You need wisdom again? Like, how many times are you going to ask me for wisdom? 
That's not, God, that's not the way God talks. He's not grudging. He doesn't, it, another translation is without reproaching, right? Without reproaching, without rebuking you. Okay, I'm going to give you wisdom, and I'm also going to give you this rebuke on the side. Now, God could rebuke us, right? He could reproach us and show us why we're wrong, but he doesn't. He just gives wisdom, and he does it ungrudgingly without accusing you and discouraging you from asking. We do that to ourselves. And you know what? Sometimes, because we are impatient people, and because we reach a limit to our tolerance that we get cranky, sometimes we, we, we think of God that way. So that when we ask God, we think that that's how God is. And this verse is telling you that you're wrong. That that earthly, unspiritual lie in your head that God is fed up with me and doesn't want to give anymore, and that he's going to give, but he's going to do it grudgingly, that's a lie. This verse is true. God gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. He's inviting you to ask him. And what will God give us? He will give us wisdom. God will give us wisdom. Even if you're at this moment not a Christian, this verse is for you. God will give you wisdom. God will give you wisdom. Actually, all of us who are Christian, at one time we were not Christian. And we didn't have wisdom. We couldn't see the goodness of God in Christ. And then God gave us eyes to see and gave us wisdom to see that he is the greatest value in the world and that he's, Jesus Christ is worth leaving everything we have to have him. That happened to us. That's how we became Christian. So if you're not a Christian and you need wisdom, that's fine. That's part of the trial that God is using to invite you to himself. God will give you wisdom. You know why, how I know that God will give you wisdom? Because God gave you more than wisdom. It says in John 3, 16, For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Non-Christian friend, God will give you wisdom if you need it, because God will give you more than wisdom. He gave you his Son. So here's an invitation to you. God is inviting you to have not just wisdom for your trial, but to have Jesus in your trial. Because God is holy and made us and we're sinners, we deserve to be damned to hell for our sins. We are all guilty of sin. God does not owe us wisdom. But God sent his son, I just read John 3.16, God sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to live the life you should have lived in wisdom, to die on the cross for your sins, and to rise from the dead, defeating Satan's sin and death, so that you, friend, so that if you will repent from your sins, and repent from your righteousness, and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord, and as your Savior, and as your treasure, and as your wisdom, God will save you right now. So if you're not a Christian, say, I need wisdom for this trial. I got a really sticky situation at home, in my finances, with this relationship. I need God's wisdom. Hey, I'm telling you, God will give you wisdom, but he's going to give you more than wisdom. He will give you his son, Jesus Christ, and he'll give you eternal life. And really, you need Jesus before you get any other kind of wisdom, really. Because that is your greatest problem. And that is our greatest solution. So God gives wisdom to all without, he gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. Christians, we need to embrace this promise. He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he, if God gave you his son, how will he not give you wisdom for your trial this week? Look at Luke 18, 1 through 8. Because the main application of this passage, the main goal is wholeheartedly ask God for what? Wisdom. But the action is ask, right? So look, everyone turn to Luke 18 if you can. If, if, you're, if you don't know where it is, that's okay. You can just listen. But this is so good that we should turn here and, and, and look at it together. Luke 18, 1 through 8, ask God. Now, Jesus told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. And that's the application, to pray always and not give up. Jesus says, there was a judge in a certain town who did not fear or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, I don't want to give this lady what she wants. Even though that's true, um, I will give her just, or, I'm sorry, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, she keeps asking, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the judge, un unjust judge says. He's going to give. 
Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay in helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find what? Faith on the earth. Prayer and persistent asking is, an, is a matter of what? Faith. Faith. Do you believe that God will answer? Do you believe, James 1.5, that God is generous and wholehearted and ungrudging in giving you wisdom for your trial? If you believe it, what is God telling you to do? Keep asking. Keep praying. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times. Keep asking. Be persistent. Pester God. Be persistent in your coming to God. Wear God out as if you could wear God out. This is God saying, you can't wear me out. Keep coming. I love you. I want to give you this wisdom. But I want to change you while you keep asking me for wisdom in faith. And so, going back to James 1.5, he gives to all generously and ungr ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. God gives wisdom. Matthew 7, verse 7 says, keep asking and you'll be... Uh, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who searches finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What, what man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good, give good things to those who ask him? God will give you as you ask him. Let me just say one more thing about this before we go to point three. God often, he times the answer of his, uh, he times his answer to your prayer. He, he times when he will give you wisdom. And he times to give you wisdom while you're in the trial. And oftentimes not before you're in the trial. Trust God to give you what you need when you need it. That's what Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 say. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way we are, yet without sin. Therefore, here's the application from Hebrews 4, therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may find, receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. At the proper time. God gives you the wisdom you need at the proper time. God times the answer for when you need it. You know, I do a lot of counseling in this church. I'm a pastor and I'm a staff pastor, so I do a lot of counseling in this church. And oftentimes when I'm counseling people, a lot of times the problem that the person has when I'm counseling them is that they want the next five steps of what to do to get through this trial. And almost always, God only gives them the next step. They want to see the solution crystal clear. They want to say, give me the five steps. Boom, 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 boom. I'm done. Great, let's move on. And God doesn't work like that. Often. He gives you the next step. And only the next step. And oftentimes my counseling is not just to give them the plan. It's actually just say, hey, you don't need the next five steps. You're not even ready for the next five steps. Your heart is not ready for the next five steps. You need to slow down. Ask God for wisdom because he will give it generously and he will give you the next step. And guess what? When he gives you the next step, you know what you need to do? You need to what? Take that next step. And then when you take that next step, he's going to give you what? The next step. And then when you take that step, he will give you the next step. And then you get three steps and four steps and five steps. But God gives you what you need when you need it. And oftentimes, part of our trial is that we think we need more than we actually need. And we get mad at God. We don't say we're mad at God because we're Christian and we know it's not right to be mad at God. But deep down, we're mad at God because he's not giving us the solution. But he is giving you the solution. It's him in the next step. Walk with me. Commune with me. Trust me. Take this next step with me. Then we could take the next step together. And so he's calling us to ask and then receive the wisdom of that next step.
Okay, so first, first point of the sermon was what should we do or what do we need? We need wisdom. The second thing is what should we do if we lack wisdom? What should we do? We should ask God for wisdom and take from him. And then thirdly, how should we ask God for wisdom? Verses 6 through 8. How should we ask God for wisdom? I'm going to give you two answers to this. The, the passage gives us two answers for how to ask for wisdom. And I'll tell you the two answers now. Ask without doubting and ask in faith. Okay? Ask without doubting and ask in faith. Let's look at verse 6. But let him, so you're going to ask God for wisdom, but let him, or he must, he should ask in faith without doubting. There it is. Those are two points. Ask in faith without doubting. Let's take the second one first. What does it mean to ask without doubting? Doubting is to be unsure, unstable, double-minded, or here's another word that will help you get at doubting, indecisive, indecisive. Doubting is to be uncertain and really at odds with oneself. So it's actually, when you doubt, you're actually fighting yourself. You're at odds with yourself because part of you wants to do this, the other part of you wants to do that, and you're not sure which way to go. And so you're actually at odds with yourself and you waver between different options. Asking in faith without doubting does not mean perfect faith without any doubts. Okay, some of you, I understand this because I have it in certain areas of my life, some of you have OCD, right, when it comes to your own faith. Is my faith real? Am I doubting? How much percent am I doubting? And you, you could think so much about whether you're doubting or not that you're going to miss the point of this passage. It is not saying to have perfect faith and zero doubt. That's not what it's saying. It's just like how courage does not mean the absence of fear. Oftentimes when you have courage... You just have enough to do it, but it may contain fear. I'm at the age now where I am officially too old to ride all the roller coasters without fear. <laughs> I don't know where I crossed that point. There was a point where that was not true of me, but now it's true of me. And my courage is constantly tested when we go to Knott's Berry Farm with my kids, especially City, because City is the most daring of them all with riding roller coasters. And so we rode a roller coaster I would never ride to, want, choose to ride. But because my nine-year-old wants to ride it, I can't not ride it. She's nine years old, you know? And so um, it was this ride called Hang Time. You guys, have you guys ever rode Hang Time at um, Knott's? It's a, it's a roller coaster that doesn't just go at a 90-degree drop. It actually goes inward. So you're, you're going this way, and then you're actually going inward. But, but the scariest thing for me was when you go up. So when you're going up to, dr to the drop, you're actually at a 90-degree angle. Like you're, sit you're laying down straight flat, and you're just looking straight up in the sky as you're going up. So you go up at a 90-degree angle. Now, when I was riding this ride, the, the scary thing was, okay, 90-degree angle, fine. At least I'm laying down flat. Well, the chair is actually a little slanted. So as the, the roller coaster is at 90 degrees, but the chair is, so you're actually like, you're slanted down as you're going up a roller coaster. I'm like, who designed this? <laughs> why, why? Why would you not just make the, the, the back flat so you can just rest and not feel like you're, you're sliding backwards as you're going up? Um, it was terrifying. <laughs> it was also really fun. I mean, once, once you get going, you know, and then you get to a point where you're like, well, I'm going to die anyways if I die, so I might as well just <laughs> enjoy the ride, right? Um, but my point here is that courage is not the absence of fear. It's enough resolve to decide to get on. That, that's, that's the point of courage. And wisdom, asking in faith without doubting, is saying, I'm trusting God enough that I'm going to take this step that he's called me to take. Not that I have no doubts. Not that I have it all, like I'm completely confident and I know everything's going to work out fine. No, you don't know that and God doesn't always give that to you. But when he tells you to ask without doubting, it's, it's to not have that overwhelming doubt that actually keeps you from getting on the ride, from taking that step. You actually have to get on to do it. So doubting here is talking about being double-minded or one other way of translating it literally is double-souled. Two life directions. It's, um, it's the opposite of loving God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength because there's only one God. Instead, we try to live and pray as if there were two gods. I love God with a lot of my heart and a lot of my soul, but not all of it. 
part of my decisiveness, my indecisiveness, is because I'm sort of committed to this other thing. So I don't know if I want to really step in and jump into this wisdom God is giving me. And we know that that doesn't work. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters. Since either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and money. Even James says in James 4, 3, you ask and you don't receive. You know why? Because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your evil desires. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity or hostility with God? Friendship with the world? When we ask God, but part of our heart is committed to worldliness and we're idolizing something in this world, we're double-minded. We're double-souled. A picture of this is the way St. Augustine prayed when he said, Lord, he struggled with sexual immorality and he was indulging, he was a slave to sexual sin. And he would pray, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. Lord, make me pure, but not yet. That, that's a prayer of a double-souled person. I want to. I want to be, I, I want to stop, but not yet. Now, at least I, I could appreciate the sincerity of that prayer, right? The honesty of that prayer. But that is a picture of being double-souled. Doubting. God, I need your wisdom, and God's going to give it, but, but not yet. I don't need that wisdom. I need some other wisdom. Don't pray for wisdom and act in foolishness. Do you really want what God's going to give you? The doubter doesn't. That's why he's doubting. Dr. Varner, who's preached uh, for us uh, a few years, uh, I guess last year, two years ago, uh, he, wrote, he wrote this. The doubter wants it both ways. To follow both the heavenly way of wisdom in his desire for success in trials and his following his own self-sufficient wisdom that results in a certain instability in his own pursuits. This is, um, remember I told you the story in Jeremiah where, where they, they were asking Jeremiah for advice and they said, give us what God says and whatever God says we're going to do. Should we stay here in Israel or should we go to Egypt because Babylon is going to attack us because, we, because of the conspiracy that just occurred. Even though we're innocent, Babylon is going to destroy us. So should we flee to Egypt or should we stay? Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 42 and 20, 43. Tell us what God says and we'll obey it no matter what he says. Jeremiah prays for 10 days. He gets the advice, we need to stay here. And if we go to Egypt, we're going to die. And they say, liar, God did not say that. We're going to die if we stay here. And they run to Egypt and they end up dying in Egypt. Exactly fulfilling Jeremiah's words. That's what a doubter is. I want God's wisdom, but then when he gives it, they don't want it. You know, John Bunyan calls this person, John Bunyan, the way he names his characters in Pilgrim's Progress, he just names them what they are, right? And he calls this person Mr. Facing Both Ways. Mr. Facing Both Ways, the doubter. I want God, but I don't want God. I actually want God and this thing. The part of the doubter that has selfish ambition doesn't realize that his self-interest, his interest to make it through and God's interest are actually the same. God wants to be glorified in our happiness and our experience of him through our trials. But because we don't fully trust that God actually wants our happiness in him, we doubt him. And that is why we can't fully wholeheartedly pray and seek and live by God's wisdom. It's because at the end of the day, we doubt God's care and God's wisdom and God's power for us. And that gets us in this double life mentality, this Mr. Facing Both Ways, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. And James gives us an analogy. Look at the verse in verse uh, 6. Let him ask without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. So the, the sea, it's, it's like you, um, you, the, the waves just go wherever the wind blows the waves. Or like a boat on the sea, if, it, if the boat has no ballast and no foundation, it can be easily swayed and tipped over and moved and changed. Like a wave that's at the mercy of the winds, so is the double-minded person, the doubter, at the mercy of all these external forces outside of himself. Because he doubts God's wisdom. God's wisdom gives you a certain stability. When you don't have God's wisdom, you're like a leaf on the ocean that floats where? Wherever the waves take it. That's what you're like. You're like a leaf floating on the waves, wherever the waves go. That's in contrast to what Tanner read earlier from Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verse 3. 
What happens to the, the wise man who meditates on God's word day and, night, day and night? He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season. He's like a tree planted. He's got roots. The wind comes, the waves come, the trials come, Satan comes, demonic forces come, doubters come, mockers come. And all of those ways of trying to move this Christian off of the path is unsuccessful. Because he's rooted in God's wisdom. He trusts God's wisdom and doesn't doubt it. He's not like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. If you are driven and tossed by the wind, what should you expect? Verse 7. The person who's driven and tossed by the wind, he should not expect what? Should not re should, when he asks for wisdom, should, should he expect to receive it? Yes or no? No. no he's not going to get it. Don't expect God to answer you favorably. Um, don't expect it. God does not promise wisdom to those who are doubting, who are not trusting that God wants what's best for them. And so God calls us, the, the Christians and non-Christians, to trust in him and repent from our doubt. Let's go back to that. Um, or, and then verse 8 says, a du being a double-minded man, he's unstable in all his ways. So we're talking about this instability. Now let's go back. I, that was all about the doubting. Let's go to the first part. Look at verse 6 again. Let him ask, not without doubting, but let him ask in what? Faith. Let him ask in faith. So what is God calling us to be? Just as we close up here, God calls us to be single-minded, ask in faith. To be wholehearted when you ask. Christian, we already read the passage from Mark, 9, Mark 8. You already decided to take up your cross and follow Jesus, didn't you? You already did. You already decided that when you became a Christian. So you, by definition, are not a doubter. You might be by, in episode after episode of trial. But by definition, if you are a Christian, you have decided to take God's wisdom in following Jesus and leaving the world behind. So just know that that's already who you are. You just need to keep going on in that faith. That saving faith that made you say, I want Jesus, and I'll, I'll leave everything else behind for Jesus, that faith is the same faith you need for this trial. Where you say, I'm going to leave everything behind and just take whatever wisdom God gives me, and I'm going to go forward with that wisdom. Don't preoccupy yourself, preoccupy yourself with morbid self-examination on how much faith you have or how much doubt you have. Just get on the roller coaster. Get on, take that next step. Trust God that he is for you and not against you. You can even ask this when you pray for wisdom. You could ask this. There's another prayer from Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. Give me an undivided heart to fear your name. So if you're saying, ah, oh, PJ, I know that I need to have a whole heart. I don't have a whole heart then ask God to give you an undivided heart. God will give you that for the next steps. Now, I told you about my, my shutdown, my mental shutdown on Monday where I just froze. I'm like 90% sure what I want to do, what I need to do for October and going forward. God hasn't made clear for me though, even right now, the next five steps. He's only made clear the next step of who I need to call to find out what's the next steps after that. And that's what God often does. He doesn't give you the next seven steps. He gives you the next step. But ask him for that wisdom. Ask him for clarity to know what that step is. And then don't doubt, but trust God and take that step. Some application for the church family, BBC family. Pray that God gives wisdom to us to help one another. Because you know it's a trial for you to help another member who's in a trial. That's your trial. Your trial is to help another member who's in trial. So just like they need wisdom for their trial, you need wisdom to help them in your trial because that is your trial. And so let's ask God to give us wisdom as a church. Let's ask God to make us a wise people, a wise community who's constantly growing in wisdom and speaking wisdom to each other. And let us then now speak wisdom to each other. We proclaim Christ, teaching and warning everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So let's speak the gospel goodness of God to one another. Children, let me say something to you kids. Thank you for making it here to the end. Thank you, Reed, for listening. Kids, listen. You need to trust that God loves you and God wants what's best for you. Trust God so much that when you have questions and you don't understand, you'll trust God anyways. 
And you know what, kids? We want to thank you as adults. Jesus points to kids as a picture of trust. So you kids, when you trust your parents, you're actually showing us how to trust God because your parents don't always know what they're doing. But you trust them. And you're a picture of how we need to trust God who always knows what he's doing. But let me say one more thing to the kids. And now I'm thinking about maybe the older-ish kids. Okay? Think about the, the, the pre-teens, maybe even the teens, but the pre-teens and the, the older kids. Okay? Kids, as you get older, you're going to get smarter. But as you get smarter, that doesn't mean you get wiser. When you get smarter, don't let your understanding of this world give you excuses to not trust God. That's what happens to us adults. I'm confessing to you kids what it's like to be an adult. Sometimes we're so smart that we can't trust God with his simple, clear truths. Because we overthink it and we make excuses why God's words will not work in our situation. We're too smart to be wise. Kids, as you grow in smartness, grow in wisdom. Keep trusting God. If you're discouraged... To the discouraged members here, God's not calling you to perfect faith and strong faith. He's just calling you to trust you with the next step. So the main goal, again, is wholeheartedly ask God for wisdom so that you receive the wisdom you need to mature through trials. So let me recap here. What do we need? Wisdom. wisdom. What should we do to get wisdom? Ask. ask God. And how should we ask God? In faith without doubting. That's what Christ did when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let this cup be passed from me. And when the Father denied him three times, Christ left that prayer time with clarity and conviction. He knew what he needed to do. He knew the, Lord was, he knew the Father was shutting down all the other options, so now it's clear. Because if there's a possibility for the cup to be passed, let's go with that one. But once that option is closed and, and the Father closes those doors and makes it clear to the Son that this is the one single step, the next step you need to take, once it was clear for Jesus, he was ready to trust the Father and take that step. Praise God. Because in that step that he took, he saved us from our sins. Amen? And he gave us the grace now to know that God will answer our prayers when we ask for wisdom. We know that God will be generous because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is graciously telling you this morning, Christian, wholeheartedly ask me for wisdom again and again and again. And I'll give it to you in your trials so that you grow in maturity and you grow in your joy in me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, take these words and hide it in our hearts that we would not sin against you. Give us the wisdom we need for the trials that we face. Thank you for trials. They're not fun. We wish they were gone. But we thank you that you give us chances to grow in faith, to grow in endurance, to grow in maturity, to grow in wisdom. So guide us, Lord, we pray. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.